thank you very much uh, for that very generous uh, introduction. I am going to talk about uh, the future of international delegation here, and uh, following Julian's lead, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, reasons that I think we are going to see more uh, intense concern about international delegations. First, going to describe the problems quite generically and in some sense uh, uh, pragmatically, and then suggest actually our uh, 19th, uh, our 18th century constitution may have a kind of solution to the problem of international delegations in the treaty power and its uh, substantial requirements um, uh, for ratification of a treaty, i.e. getting two-thirds of the Senate. So why, we, why might we see, first of all, a uh, pressure for international delegations in the future? I think this is really an old story, uh, uh, acceleration of techno technological change and uh, the interconnections of the world create externalities among nations, and that's going to mean there's going to be a greater interest in coming to uh, joint agreements about what law is, and precisely for the same reasons that we also then saw in the 20th century the rise of the domestic administrative state, because many of these issues, particularly issues like pollution, are very complicated and can not easily be resolved by legislatures, there'll be an interest in delegating matters. But delegating matters in this case, because they're international problems, to international actors, and then having them um, have their decisions have direct effect in various nations, including the United States, which is, of course, the difficulty of waiting until um, uh, having another whole uh, agreement on giving them direct effect is there are huge holdout problems. And so I think that's the reason we're going to see a movement or pressure for international delegations. Well, international delegations, just pragmatically, they have some real problems, I think, for democratic governance. And I think the way to see how acute they are is to compare them to domestic delegations, which also have substantial problems for democratic governance that are, I think, quite well understood. I think they can be summarized in two ways. One is uh, what I would call the democratic deficit of delegation. These bureaucrat and agents, they're not democratically elected uh, while they carry out um, uh, uh, their actions under uh, the requirements of some statute. There's a lot of slack there. Uh, so that's one concern. Another concern, maybe even worse, uh, from a public choice perspective, uh, that members of the legislature and will be happy uh, to uh, uh, reward special interest groups who will be able to better influence agents than they are uh, the legislature. They'll re recognize that they can uh, distance themselves from their uh, decisions and yet reward interest groups. And that's a well-known uh, theory in the literature about why Congress delegates, why one, why want to excessively uh, delegate, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. How do we deal with this in the domestic uh, constitution? Uh, well, I think the way we've de dealt with it largely is to have substantial oversight through the president, uh, through uh, our own uh, court uh, system uh, of delegations. Whether that's a complete uh, answer is, is unclear. Uh, we have also have, I think, a, a requirement at least that Congress make it clear that it's making a delegation. Note that the first kind of response that we're um, uh, simply going to have the president oversee the delegation of authority really isn't available in the international context. Moreover, in some sense, so this shows, I think, why the international context of delegation may be even more problematic. Another area that makes it <laughs> more problematic is that it may be very difficult for the nations who are, of course, separate. It's a problem of multiple principles. Here, at least you can conceive of the principle uh, as being the president, or at least being representing uh, the people as the principal and, and disciplining the agents. We have multiple agents in the international context. And that means, I think, that the problem of democratic deficit and of agency costs is more acute in the international context. So what, what possibly can we do about that? One possibility is you might think, well, if there's a big democratic deficit and we think there's maybe too much delegation because members would like to create a lot of agency costs and reward interest groups, is up front we could have 
Uh, something that uh, I worked on a lot with uh, Mike Rappaport. We could have a supermajority rule disciplining that. We could, the democratic deficit means that right up front, uh, it means that um, uh, uh, the stringent process for entrenching a, uh, this provision in a constitution, we think, provides an analogy maybe to this. We, we require a big um, uh, um, uh, a supermajority requirement up front, and that allows uh, us to constrain uh, current majorities. We're less worried about that, theoretically. Similarly, with respect to agency costs, the presence of high agency costs makes international delegations potentially costly, but, and, 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 but the supermajority rule requires more support for international delegations, thus filtering out uh, the, uh, the, the delegations where the, where the costs exceed their benefits, given that Congress isn't likely fully to perceive those costs uh, to, to, the, to the people. So that's the argument. Many similar arguments have actually been made in the, in the domestic context why we have a clear statement rule is that's also a way of disciplining uh, domestic uh, delegation. So that's the argument why you actually might think that might be a kind of solution. Well, this gets me around, of course, to our 19th century, 18th century constitution, because lo and behold, we do have a provision of the 18th century constitution that has a supermajority rule, and that's the treaty provision. It requires a supermajority uh, for um, uh, actors uh, for uh, treaties to be made. And so in the small time I have left remaining, I'll defend two uh, propositions. One, that you should not be, uh, as a kind of originalist matter, be able to delegate direct effect, in other words, the power of some confederal or international power to have direct effect in the United States through statute, and you can do through treaty. And I'll just talk about this very briefly. Uh, first, uh, with respect to statute, I think there are huge problems uh, in just a statutory matter of delegation, and they come from the Appointments Clause and from Article 3, because ordinarily in our domestic system, uh, we uh, require the president to appoint agents with substantial power, and certainly with respect to judicial power, they have to go through Article 3. Of course, an international delegation, where we have international agents, that's really not going to work. And so that's the problem uh, there. With respect to the treaty power, uh, one wonders, well, then why, how does the treaty power help you? And I have a variety of historical arguments, and historical arguments are hard to rehearse, uh, I think, in a, uh, in a brief way, uh, in, a, in a talk such as this. And so let me just give you a hint of them. Uh, the basic argument is that uh, uh, the treaty clause answers the complaints under the appointments clause in Article 3, it agrees with the basic contention uh, that international tribunals are operating under international or perhaps confederal law, as it would have been called at the time of uh, the framing, but they can have nevertheless domestic effect because that was understood uh, to be an attribute of a treaty that was brought in over the transom into domestic law by the, 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 uh, by the supremacy clause. And as evidence of this, uh, I think we appeal to Alexander Hamilton, and he says, in fact, it was well understood that to give the power the most ample latitude, he's talking about the treaty power, to render it competent to all stipulations with the making of exigencies of the national affairs might require, competent to making treaties of all kinds, alliance, treaties of commerce, treaties of peace, and every other species of convention usual among nations. Well, one convention that was possible among nations was a treaty of confederation in which the center was able to have some direct effect on the states that joined it. And that isn't just an abstract point. The quote that I just read from Hamilton comes in the context of the Jay Treaty, which gave such a direct effect to a tribunal to settle certain debts of merchants and some of these same complaints came up. Well, you can't give them the ability to make direct effect in the United States. And Hamilton answers this and says, in fact, uh, it claims it. He says that he argued that uh, the, the treaty power allowed you to establish within the country's tri tribunals otherwise unknown to our constitutions and law. So it's not only this abstract view, this actually was the controversy at issue in the case. For some more historical evidence, I think you can look to the Articles of Confederation itself. That was a treaty among the states 
which gave a confederal power that bound some of the states. And um, in an, an article I'm working on, I'm looking at the way the confederal power of the confederation uh, bound uh, the states. So that's the basic argument that it's all right under the treaty power. And I'll say one other uh, point and then uh, subsist. Uh, one concern you might have generally about the structure of international delegations, looking at our current delegations, is they actually don't <laughs> constrain. They don't have our structure of separation of powers or even a comparable international structure of inter separation of powers that tries to protect against the large agency costs of international agents. One advantage of a high hurdle to get international delegations from the most powerful country in the world may be to give incentives uh, to uh, the international order to think about how under international law to put in the kinds of separation of powers uh, structures and other constraints on agencies uh, because then we'll be more likely to ratify uh, uh, treaties with international delegations. So that's the why I don't I want to all claim that this is the perfect solution, uh, but I think uh, oddly enough uh, uh, to a very pragmatic concern of the 21st century, uh, I do think there may be an answer actually in the formal, in the formal originalist understanding of a central part of our own constitution of the treaty power. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Uh